You're listening to Corb Conversations on the Business of Brands with Sudeep Chawla and Sharavana Raghavan. So Sharan, what is this doomsday conspiracy you keep talking about? <laughs> it's not a doomsday conspiracy, but it's more an opinion that I hold really close to my heart. Mhm. And in fact, it is to avoid the impending doom. So let's allay a few fears today. Okay. That I encounter with a lot of the entrepreneurs I meet. And maybe if you have the chance, just maybe alarm a few of the listeners. Hmm. And I'm starting out with my most provocative statement of the evening to say your product does not matter to the consumer and it will not determine your success. Okay. Product does not matter to the consumers. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to take the bait as of now. I'm sure that's your usual uh, either dramatization or rant. So <laughs> let me let me first try to provoke you more. Are you saying that if I make an inferior product it doesn't matter the consumers wouldn't would be okay with it they wouldn't find it out no a bad product will get found out hmm but a good good product will never get discovered just because it's a good product okay so having a good product will in no way guarantee success in the market mm mm-hmm. whatever you can make the other person can also make manufacturing capabilities are table stakes today especially mm-hmm. in fmcg where i largely operate but in most other industries too just by making a good quality product you are not going to have a strong business people are not going to find out about your product and come flocking to it because there's just a plethora of options in the market and i know there is this thing people talk about right differentiate or die it's all about differentiation i want my usp hmm I think this differentiator die was coined by Michael Dell. Hmm. And I think he's almost dead. But hmm. <laughs> I see a lot of emerging businesses invest so heavily in their MVP. This whole concept of the minimum viable product is is taken very seriously and they get the technical aspects of it, the functional aspects of it to the T. But what it is is the MVP. It is the minimum viable product. that is the minimum you required to do but how many people get by by just doing the minimum hmm. you need to build up every mvp with a strong brand narrative or something that i call the minimum viable brand because you must have at least the basics of your brand in place to give your business a chance hmm. and the world is full of this and i see a lot of entrepreneurs who say i've made a great product and that is why i will succeed unfortunately you will not and so i just go into a little bit of theory so this golden book on positioning written by al rees and jack trout mm. positioning for your mind mm. they say i'm quoting from there they say the basic approach of positioning is not to create something new and different mm. but to manipulate what's already there in the mind mm. to retie the connections that already exist mm. positioning is about taking what is already there and rewiring it mm. you won't always have the chance to build something new mm. Mm. you got to find ways to build a narrative and that rewiring is the narrative mm. and in most categories i might sound very fatalistic here but it's a truth differentiation is almost dead even if there is differentiation it makes little difference to the consumer if i say i've added this ingredient in my product somebody else will do it very soon but by the time the consumer understands the importance of this ingredient the fad is gone and the consumer is sold primarily on the narrative of the brand and it's the emotional hook that brings them in it's not necessarily about the differentiation itself so therefore you first said that product is not important now you're saying differentiation is not important so then what do you want the businesses to focus on <laughs> good so don't get me wrong i'm not saying differentiation is wrong hmm. right i'm saying i'm just saying it is rare 
and businesses cannot wait around to differentiate their product to get started only to find the next guy doing it a lot faster and neutralizes their differentiation advantage hmm. it's not something you can bank your business on anymore therefore you are referring to product differentiation right yes and thank you for bringing that up because most people when they talk about differentiation they only mean product today hmm. but differentiation can be driven by a service offering the distribution method the relationship you have with the clients the reputation you're building for yourself your pricing strategy hmm. all of this could be differentiation factors hmm. but all of them are applicable unless it is tied together with a strong brand narrative fair now i can see where where your passion was coming from because okay. there is a brand narrative coming to the fore okay so would you just rewind back and tell us why have you chosen this topic and then let's get deeper into it it's nice to bring up the why in the middle of the episode but yeah yeah so it's because like i said i see a lot of businesses build their capabilities today hmm. and the moment they say i can do exactly what the market leader is doing i have a right to win in this category hmm. but that isn't true they think they can have a similar success trajectory just because somebody before them has done it they fail to understand that it's not about what they know but it's about what consumers know what you can do for them hmm. and also the other factor is that the market leaders have become market leaders today by taking the risk of doing something somebody else didn't do they did something afresh and that's why they are market leaders today hmm. and just aping them will not get you the same benefits because your competition is always going to be better at being themselves than you are going to be at being them hmm okay so if you are not a market leader then what is your advice should we should they quit business i i like how you've taken the provocative stand today hmm but see i'm saying they must move a mindset hmm from wanting to ape what the market leader is doing and not just match what they what the market leader is doing or the other players in the market are doing but to aspire and plan to do something better they need to have the mindset to take the risks to reap the rewards that they're looking for mm -hmm. they have to build exceptional extraordinary brands that speak to the right target audience period hmm today with the cluttered competition in almost every category you can think of not taking a risk is actually a far bigger risk than actually taking a risk if you get what i mean hmm that sound like a fairly risky statement <laughs> could you just repeat it again not taking a risk is hmm. riskier than hmm. actually taking a risk today hmm okay Because yeah by risk i mean having a clear sharp positioning for a specific target audience hmm so i'll give an example to clarify that better yeah we were all in, the, in marketing when sunfeast launched right yeah and what did sunfeast initially do sunfeast hmm. launched without a very clear brand narrative hmm they called everything sunfeast they aped britannia's product portfolio completely hmm and then through the distribution strength they got some categories working but in britannia's core what we call the mainstream biscuit category they just couldn't shake britannia hmm and they wanted to take on good day which was the number one biscuit mm -hmm. then i think still is and they created mom's magic and they tried to hijack good day's nostalgia bit even today hmm. people buy mom's magic only when good day is an available Hmm. it doesn't hold a candle to good day at all hmm but they did something very different in the other two segments hmm they took sunfeast special creams and they understood it's the children who are buying it with their pocket money hmm. the cream biscuit category and they said i'm going to give them greater volume they made the cookie thicker not necessarily better but thicker than britannia treat and they launched it as bounce and the entire communication was through cartoons and cartoon network stuff and that captured people's attention the kids attention mm. and 
I don't think T Tessens recovered from there because what they almost doubled the size of the pack for the same price mm. that Treat was offering. And also what Sunfeast did when they saw Oreo launch and have success a cream biscuit in the premium category, mm. Britannia tried doing it, but they really didn't have too much of a narrative to build because they have a eat healthy, think better master brand identity. And mm. that didn't quite augur well for its indulgence of the pure magic they tried to build. Mm. But Sunfeast very smartly launched a sub-brand of dark fantasy. Mm. And they said, I'm going to target adults with the indulgent category in cookies. Mm. And they did the replica of Oreo first. Then they did the chocofills. Mm. And today, I think they are the number one indulgent biscuit brand in India or a cookie brand in India. Mm-hmm. And that's something that they've done by doing things differently, even though they were a late entrant. They've mm-hmm. done something new in that category. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that is why they've become market leaders today. And in places, the same, Sunfeast, same company, where they did not do anything different in the good day category, in the cookie category, they had no success. Mm-hmm. But when they did something different in bounce and dark fantasy, they've seen stupendous success. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's the risk you should be willing to take for the brand to have any chance of success. Mm. But Sharon, if we were to think about those examples, both these examples actually, uh, you're saying we spoke about product differentiation not really creating a difference and you right. need more levers of differentiation and therefore, mm-hmm. you know, proposition becomes a big differentiator which helps you create your brand narrative that is what you were going towards Mm -hmm. now both these examples are of brands which uh, for example in at least the indulgent category for adults sunfeast definitely came up with very very differentiated products yeah at least those uh, center filled cookies etc was something that nobody else had done Right. So that is that is where I think they were able to bring product differentiation. Right. However, your treat example is very interesting. Product was different, but not so different. Exactly. And, you know, because they did bounce, you're saying that it was a branded difference. It was branded. It was the, they enhanced the product. Hmm. Now, from the time bounce did this thicker cookie, lesser cream, but more flavorful cream, Parley also tried doing it. Mm. But Bounce has taken off that, that narrative completely. Mm. Mm. And just to go back to the cream fills, the center fill, uh, choco fill example of dark fantasy, mm. there are others also done it now. Even Parley mm. has done the center fills cookies now. Mm. And there are a million local brands who can have, who can do the center fill cookie. The technology is available to everybody. Mm. But what do you think of when you think of center fills today? Mm. It's because they had the narrative even before they had the product. Mm. And they've taken over the entire indulgence in the cookie category. Mm. Mm. And that narrative is what enables them to even hold forth in the chocofills. It's They didn't build it on the product differentiation. While that did crack news for the initial bit, mm. it is the brand narrative that held the entire piece together that they're able to still ride on it today. Fair. So I think... I can relate to this because a lot of the businesses in many sectors that I've operated in recently have the ambition of becoming a strong number two. Right. Yeah. So, and that's a very valid assumption, you you know, for all the listeners out there, it is perfectly okay. You don't need to be a world beater all the time. You can start with the ambition of being a very strong number two. But like Sharon is saying, a strong number two does not mean that you exactly copy the number one. Absolutely. You would still have to differentiate yourself. And I think, Sharon, the point that you're making is don't just think product differentiation. Do branded differentiation. And that will lead you to sometimes do something on the product. Or it could lead you to do sometimes many things on your stories, narratives, and many other things associated with the product. Yeah. Right. And what you call branded differentiation is what I call distinctive brand sets, creating very clear distinct brand assets to tell your story Mm. with. You're listening to Corb, conversations on the business of brands. Your hosts are Sudeep Chavla, marketing practitioner, business leader 
an educator to advertising and marketing professionals and Sharavana Raghavan of Vitral Innovations, consultants to consumer facing brands and businesses. For more information, go to copcast.net. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling your friends and rating us. So, uh, Sharan, I remember in one of the previous episodes we had spoken about uh, not uh, differentiating or segmenting people demographically. Right. We had said that don't, uh, you know, don't uh, go what go for terms like mini millennials. Yes. Yeah. And we had then you know spoken about the fact that you should look at different vectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In fact, that episode of ours also won an award. Yes, that's a wonderful plug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for anchor for recognizing that particular podcast at as one of its spotlight winners for September. But coming back, so now for any brand, once they are looking at you know differentiation, they would have to first look at segmentation. Yeah. Right. So that they see their consumers, etc. Do you have any particular segmentation that makes sense? which the brands can pick and then they can, you know, really build upon it. I'm not necessarily talking about segmentation so much today, Sudeep. I'm Mm -hmm. focusing on identifying the right kind of people to build your brand for. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit in targeting, but I'm not taking the targeting mindset here. Mm -hmm. So if you look at any category, there are different kinds of consumers who consume Mm -hmm. the category. Yeah. First, you have these innovators. People who are very eager to try something new all the time and be at its cutting edge, be the first triers of everything that is launched. Second, there are the early adopters. They are interested in new products, but they will justify why they are interested in these new products. They want the advantage that they will get or the better experience they will get by trying the new product that's in the market. Mm -hmm. Then you have the early and the late majorities. Now these, I think the early and the late majorities would make up roughly about 60% of the business. Now, Mm. this is the biggest chunk. And they are the pragmatists who adopt the proven products because everybody else is saying so. It's been proven in the market. They're not risk takers. And they will buy it only if the others have said it's a good thing. Mm. And finally, you have the laggards who are very reluctant to adopt to anything new unless they absolutely have to. Hmm. So in this, in very commonsensical general marketing wisdom, it says target the mass in the middle, which Mm -hmm. is the early and the late late. majorities. Yeah. But they are not going to budge. They are, they're very difficult to budge. Hmm. So you, in any category that you're operating, you should build for either the innovators or at worst, the early adopters. Mm. And get them to bring in the others. Mm. So when you do that, it can be a little scary. Because at first you are shrinking your target audience to such a small segment of the entire universe that you can focus on. But this is not deprioritization. This is just focusing. And these consumers who try your product first will bring in the other early and late majorities. And that is the kind of focus you need to have to know who you're building your brand for. Uh, I just want to clarify this. So in in my mind, when I think about it, I thought that uh, founders or uh, builders should build it for the masses, but market it to the early adopters or innovators, because those are the guys who will try it out. And once they find it okay and they start mass trying, then you're early and late majorities would follow would you would you say we should market for market to these guys early adopters and innovators or should we build for them you should build for them because Mm. who is harder to please Mm. the harder they are to please the tougher it is for you to win there and the Mm. moment you won with them the the rest of it following is easier Mm. and your competitive edge is that much stronger because if you if they cannot be shaken, the rest cannot be shaken. Building for this niche makes it that much stronger for you. Hmm. 
Yes, okay. you will market to the masses to scale, hmm. but that's not who you will start with. Okay. So suppose now I'm a business hmm. and I identify who are going to my who are going to be my early adopters. Right. What's the next step then? Once your positioning is sorted, your target audience is defined. Hmm. You start building your distinctive assets, which I hmm. spoke about a little earlier too. I call them collateral. They are unique brand assets that tell your story or tell elements of your story even when you're not saying anything. Hmm. Now, this is the softer aspects of your brand. The tone you use, the personality you'd, you demonstrate, the colors you use, the visual cues, even the sound cues. So, which brand says ting, ting, ting? Hmm. Britannia. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, that's how you build So. That's a nice, uh, even slogans fall into this. Mm. But I, I, uh, an example just came to mind. Mm. When, uh, you remember the South Africa World Cup football? Mm -hmm. When this song, Waving Flag, became a big hit. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't even the official song. Yeah. And uh, this Kane Arn was the singer. Yeah. And there was a Shakira song, which was the official song for the World Cup. Waka Waka. Yeah. Waka Waka. Yeah. And uh, Coke tied up with this k singer mm. and made him modify his song mm. to include this bit which was supposed to be for oh hey, oh, hey, oh. Mm. and yeah. that was supposed to stand for open happiness of coke oh nice uh. and that is a brand set so when you hear that oh hey, oh, hey, oh mm. apparently consumers are triggered to have coke because they reminded of the brand because of the tone. So yeah. I'm not sure how true it is and how strong the consumer must be to be triggered by the sound. Mm. But I thought it was very interesting that they even had this thought process to do it to an existing song and make that so popular that they didn't have to advertise it after that. Yeah, I've seen this now happening slightly more frequently, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Somebody quoted this example to me and, you know, there's this known uh, of mine who does this for a business they call it as mogo which is musical logo right and i've now seen for example if you walk into an hdfc atm today mm. when you take out the money it plays a sound right very it's desi a sound, yeah. sound of yeah. Sorts. yeah it is their mogo and they have mm. now started putting this into everything similarly right. reliance you travel in the metro here mm -hmm. you will keep hearing this reliance sound throughout mm. Yeah, from time to time. So okay. I've now seen a lot of brands investing into some musical signatures such right. that the, you know, like you're saying, it's not about making new connections, but rewiring old ones. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, when you when birds chirp, it can be nothing but a, a morning sign for you, early morning nature sign for you. So there are certain cues that already exist within us mm. that brands can take to establish the rewiring for us. Mm, mm, mm. And these, th these brand distinct assets, they have become the drivers of salience and not mm. just for brand awareness, mm. but the full width and depth of all associations a brand can have in the consumer's mind. Mm. The whole point is that you sit in the consumer's mind and when they think of your category, you pop into their head. You're the only one who pops into their head. Mm. And that is driven by the distinctive assets you can build for yourself. Mm -hmm. Why go very far? Our alma mater of Cadbury. Anything today in chocolate in India, any mm -hmm. product that includes chocolate, becomes believable only if they have the color purple in some form or the other. Mm. Yeah. And that, that purple belongs to Cadbury. Mm. And today, Cadbury is a synonymous a term for chocolate in India. Mm. And that is a distinctive asset. Yeah. And this also. So, see, people don't remember ads anymore. Mm. So, the research says if you show people just 10 ads, 10 different ads, less than 16% of them can recall the first ad mm. from just the 10 ads or even link it to the right brand. So, when there's so much clutter, your distinct assets do all the work for you. There is this controversial professor, Byron Sharp. He wrote mm. the book, How Brands Grow. Right? Yeah. And that he says, the most important part of any buyer's purchasing process occurs before the buyer's conscious evaluation of the brands they choose. Mm, mm. 
the buyers in effect decide not to consider a vast majority of the brands actually not even consider and most of the time they just consider one brand mm. and that is driven by the distinctive assets that they are frequented with okay fair so you made a point to say that you know uh, only banking on product differentiation is possibly too risky Mm-hmm. so therefore go for branded differentiation and then you said that choose a niche audience or the appropriate audience and do, then go for building brand collaterals yes okay, sounds logical mm. then why do you think a lot of the businesses and marketers are not doing it i would love to blame all the engineers who are into marketing today mm. <laughs> aren't you one of them <laughs> yeah i am an engineer for sure yes at least by education So there's a book called Thinking Fast Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Mm-hmm. And in that he goes into a little bit of theory as system 1 and system 2 thinking. Mm-hmm. System 1 is something that happens very instinctively in a subconscious level. There are decisions we take in a very subconscious level. Let's say you're driving to work. You know every day what path you take, where you turn, where you even park sometimes if you have designated parking at office. Mm. You're happy to take a call. and then you're comfortable doing it but let's say there is a road block in your in your regular route now you start looking for a work around at that time would you be as comfortable taking the call most people aren't hmm. because yeah. that's broken your subconscious thinking now we have to do conscious thinking now this conscious thinking becomes your system 2 thinking yeah so he says that's the difference and we as marketers do such system 2 thinking and expect people to behave so rationally mm. in making their purchase decisions but mm. let alone consumers even human beings are not rational most of the time mm. Mm. so while we think for a consumers in a very rational process it doesn't happen that way mm. the idea is for a brand to seep in to people's system 1 thinking which cannot be done merely by differentiation which is actually a system 2 property the product differentiation is logic driven therefore it's system 2 mm. property mm. system 1 is a subconscious so your mm. brand distinctive assets of your brand the distinctiveness of your brand will dictate how well you can seep into their subconscious and mm. that is why we make these mistakes we do fair fair i get the point so therefore uh, you know not only are we saying that you should uh, look at branded differentiation and create it first for a, a specific niche audience by building distinctive collaterals but you design them in a manner such that you know consumers don't need to go through a high level qualitative logical thinking it should subconsciously occur to them yes and if you build it that way then as byron sharp says you already excluded a lot of your competition from their consideration yes mm. and that's the only way you can build a brand today in the clutter that we all face yeah that's very logical sharan i think for a change uh, you have not honestly uh, uh, tried to attack a particular theory <laughs> but what you have done possibly is uh, give a build up to poss- to kind of solve a practical problem that many of our listeners might be facing today because they are entering categories where they would want to differentiate vis-a-vis the incumbents in one way or the other so if they follow this path i'm sure it will lead them in the right direction yeah hopefully thank you for listening to cob conversations on the business of brands with sudeep chawla and sharavana raghavan subscribe and learn more at copcast.net that's c o b b c a s t .net